All right. Thank you everyone for coming to the Black Health Forum. Um, this is our second one. Uh, this one will be focusing on Black women's health. Um, Corey Gaither, president of the Cal Poly Pomona Black Alumni Chapter. Um, I wanna definitely thank before we start the Cal Poly Pomona Alumni Office staff for helping us coordinate this event. And I also want to thank the Black Alumni Chapter Board for helping to promote and extend their network. Um, definitely appreciate the work you guys have done in um, having us have this event. Um, it's so important um, during these times to really talk about health and prevention. Um, let's see this person. Um, what I want to do is introduce our moderator and then introduce our panelists and then start pretty much the program. So first, our moderator is Dr. Cook. She grew up in Compton, California and completed her undergraduate education with a BS in biology at Cal Poly Pomona University, a master's of public health from UCLA and her medical degree at Stanford University. Prior to attending medical school, she worked for nine years for the County of San Diego in various roles, including public health educator, budget and contract analyst, and assistant district manager for the welfare office serving the homeless population of downtown San Diego. Dr. Cook completed her internship and residency in internal medicine at Alameda County Medical Center in Oakland, California. She is a board, certi she is board certified in internal medicine and obesity medicine and works as an internalist, internist and obesity specialist at Kaiser Permanente Martinez, where she has served in a variety of leadership roles. Dr. Cook is currently president of the Sinclair Miller Medical Association, the local Bay Area chapter of the National Medical Association. Please welcome Dr. Cook. Next, I wanna introduce one of our panelists. Dr. Sydney Oro Kunle is graduate of Cal Poly Pomona University, uh, majored in biolo biolo bio biological science pre-med completed a post-grad program at UCLA David Griffin School of Medicine, then went on to complete medical school at St. George's University School of Medicine. She completed her third three-year residency in family medicine at San Joaquin General Hospital in Stockton, California. She is a board certified family medicine physician at Kaiser Permanente in Sacramento, California, working in adult and in family medicine department. Please welcome Dr. Oro Kunle. Yes. <laughs> and then we are possibly looking forward to having Dr. Chikta welcome, uh, attend the event as well. We'll be looking out for him um, to pop up, but we'll go ahead and start. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Sherilyn Cook and I'm really excited to have one of my colleagues actually at Kaiser on with me tonight. And hopefully Dr. Choctaw will join us as well. Personally, I work in adult and family medicine. I take care of a lot of women, but I don't do a lot of women's health, which family medicine physicians are more likely to do. So one of the first things we just wanted to open up with is a general question um, about how can black women advocate for themselves, you know, in medicine, you know, we all know that African American women in particular have received less medical care, not as good medical care over the years. So doctor, pronounce your name for me, please. Or I don't want to mispronounce it. <laughs> it was okay. Oral Kunle. Oral Kunle, please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Oral Kunle. Can you just mention a little bit about how women, African-American women can advocate effectively for themselves with their physicians? Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Cook. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, I just first wanted to thank the um, Cal Poly Pomona Black Alumni Association, Corey and Dr. Cook uh, for this opportunity. I 
really appreciate um, this opportunity to share, to share with um, women, Black women in the community. And so, yeah, so to answer your question, what are some ways um, Black women can advocate for themselves um, uh, in the clinic and, and with their physicians is first off, I would say be prepared. Number one, um, uh, come to your office visits prepared, do your research, um, uh, look things up, look up your medical conditions, know what, your, um, know what medications you're taking, know how they interact with other medications. Um, I see a lot of my patients, I even had one today um, who came in with a list of medical conditions, uh, prescriptions, allergies, surgeries that she had. And, and gave that to me because a lot of times they're coming from one um, medical center to, an, to another, from Sutter to Kaiser, you know? So we don't have all of their um, information. So um, coming prepared, um, doing your research, um, and this way you can have an informed conversation with your doctor. It's just not a one way, um, you know, barking orders, but you too can, um, can come together and you guys can um, and make decisions together. Um, I would say also another thing is ask questions, be engaged. Just don't take the doctor's word for it. Um, you ask questions. Um, if you don't understand, you know, a particular condition, if you don't understand, you know, what IBS, what, you know, what is IBS? What are uterine fibroids? How do I get that? You know, how can that affect my pregnancy? Um, you know, those are all good questions to ask. How does my, my family history affect um, me having diabetes or high blood pressure. And so asking questions is really important. Another one, I was talking to Corey before this conversation was um, getting a second opinion, get a second opinion. Don't just go with what your doctor is saying. If you have questions, if you, if you, um, you're not, you know, settled with the, um, the, the treatment plan, um, it's okay to ask questions and it's okay to get a second opinion, okay? Because you're entitled to that. Um, for so long, you know, some patients may be so used to their doctor for so many years, or oh, I've had Dr. So-and-so for 20 years, you know? And so they create that, um, that bond, but it's good to also get a second opinion. Um, I would also have to say is doctor shop, okay? Doctor shop, look on their website, read their bios, Kaiser Permanente, they have uh, um, bios on your website, you know, all about the doctor, read about your doctor to see if it's the, if it's the right fit for you. Um, you know, are they more into um, prescribing medications? Or are they all more like, you know, holistic and, and whole body wellness, you know, that can all be in their, in their website. So it's, it's really good to doctor shop. A lot of my patients will seek after an African-American doctor, an African-American woman doctor, because, um, because I, you know, you, you just, you just have that mutual understanding, you know, some of the, the, you know, some of the foods that we like to eat or, you know, what we kind of, you know, go to. So having that also makes a difference. Um, so, and then also too, I would um, take notes. Keep, keep a pad. You know, I had a patient today too. She had a checklist of things that she wanted to go through during the appointment. So she, you know, made a checklist because a lot of times doctors only have about 10 to 15 minute appointments with you. And so, you know, they're seeing 16 to 20 patients in a day. And so we get really busy. So having that checklist um, can really um, make things easy for both you and the doctor. Yeah. Um, and then even before you start um, getting, you know, uh, uh, speaking with your physician, schedule a meet and greet, schedule a meet and greet appointment. So you get to meet your doctor, um, you know, so, so you get to ask questions and, and what are their views and what are their views on this? And what are their views on, you know, when, wo you know, women's mortality rate and, and, and do they know about, you know, certain research and articles that have been out about, um, you know, black women, women mortality um, and, you know, in the OB setting. So, you know, ask those questions, you know, asking those questions are really important. Yeah, I yeah. agree. I think it's really good to have one who is sort of a match to what you want to do. And I think another thing is none of us are going to be offended by you asking questions. None of us are going to be offended by you getting a second opinion. And I kind of liken it to 
you know, I have a master's degree, I have a medical degree, but when I go to the auto mechanic, I don't know a thing. So I have to ask a lot of questions. So, you know, people can be very educated, but that does not necessarily mean you understand what's going on medically with you. So I think mm -hmm. I agree that that's very important. Uh, another thing that you touched on is a lot of uh, patients seek out black doctors and that's true. And there have been actual studies that have shown that black patients tend to get better care and have better outcomes when they are affiliated with black doctors. And I don't know if you can speak a little bit more about that because that's something that has been shown. You know, it's quite interesting. There's bias in all of us. And there have actually been studies that show that even black physicians are biased towards black patients, but not as much so as other physicians. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, people do tend to have better outcomes with black physicians. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I've had um, some patients have horrible, horrible experiences with other, with other physicians, you know, um, coming in with complaints and dismissing those complaints as if they're, they're, they're nothing, um, you know, coming in. Um, so, so, and so they really want, so I've had patients seek after black women physician, um, just because, you know, that relatability that, you know, that understanding, um, it really goes a long way. It really does. It really does. And, um, and then you're there to help and support each other, you know, woman to woman, you understand a lot of the, um, the gynecological issues that women go through. So I feel that it's, um, it's, it's really important. It's really crucial because other races do it too. So, <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's, it's really important to seek after. My uncle the other day was asking for African-American physician in Seattle, Washington, because that's where he lives. And so, and I'm finding it, honestly, I'm finding it more too in the mental health, the mental health arena. They really want African-American therapists. That is really important. That is really important. I've had patients out um, African-American therapists, especially when it comes to depression and anxiety. That's true. And unfortunately, there's a huge shortage of African-American psychiatrists as well as therapists. So sometimes it's very challenging to find someone. So mm -hmm. that is, you know, really difficult. There's a comment in the chat about um, someone who had a daughter um, from a black person's, you know, sickle cell anemia. And I can tell you that one of the things that's sort of notorious is patients with sickle cell anemia showing up in the emergency department and their pain is dismissed a lot of times, unless someone is very well versed in sickle cell anemia and know the type of pain that it can have. So again, sort of having that sensitivity, knowing about the disease, knowing what it causes. You know, I acquired a, a primary patient that just went through hell, frankly, every time she had a crisis because people did not want to treat her pain. So, I mean, it, you know, that is, a, I'll make a pitch for that as well. Um, other questions that, um, have, that we wanted to kind of delve into a little bit about preventative measures. And we all know about, you know, for women, you know, cervical cancer screening, mammograms for breast cancer screening, which is huge for black women in particular. Um, any other suggestions that you um, have Dr. Orokule about, you know, sort of preventative measures that black women can take that are just outside of just the, like the standard to keep themselves healthy? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that's a good question, Dr. Cook. And I would say um, a lot of, I'm seeing it, I'm seeing a trend in the clinic. And this is not only African-American women, this is young women across the board, across races, um, an increase in obesity. An increase in obesity is a huge thing. Um, I, I've been seeing a lot of young women um, BMIs of 60, BMIs of 50, um, morbid obesity, even amongst the young. So what I really stress to my patients are, 
um, exercise, eat right, eat healthy, um, less of the processed foods, less of the eating out, you know, less of the grub hubs, um, but more cooking in house, less, uh, you know, refined carbohydrates, um, the white rice, the, the pastries, the breads, the, the pastas and, and more brown rice, quinoa. So, so eating right, that is a big one. And then with the, with, with the pandemic, I've been seeing a rise in, um, I've been seeing a rise in alcoholism. So a lot of people are drinking, going to alcohol, going to drugs, um, going to smoking, um, the marijuana and vaping. That's huge. That's huge in the clinic. And so, um, you know, encouraging, even the young patients are coming in and trying the vaping. I had one young patient and she called me, she called me on the phone and said, doc, my lungs are on fire. My lungs are on fire. And I said, get to the ER right now. She had been vaping and she ended up in the ICU on a breathing machine. And they found her CT scan showed lung injury all across the board. And she was about 17 years old. And so this is what the vaping, and, and she got it from a friend who got it from a friend who got it from the black market. So who knew, who knows what they laced that vaping with, you know? And so a lot of my young patients are coming in vaping. And so a lot of parents will ask me to counsel their young, their, their, their kids on vaping and, and marijuana. And so, um, so trying to practice good habits is really important. Exercising 30 minutes to one hour a day, joining a gym. Even in the elderly, I, I, I recommend silver sneakers, you know, because that will help you prevent um, osteoporosis and falls. Exercising, exercising, vitamin D and calcium, taking a multivitamin. So these are all great ways to help um, uh, prevent chronic disease, okay? Prevent diabetes, prevent high cholesterol, yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, the, um, you know, obesity, if you think about it, um, diabetes is a symptom of obesity. High blood pressure is a symptom of obesity. So, you know, we call those disease, those are the diseases, but in reality, those are the consequence of the disease of obesity. So, and that's kind of, you know, for personal reasons, family, and that type of thing is one of the reasons why I got involved in obesity medicine, because I got tired of just like throwing pills or, you know, even lifestyle after, you know, something to try to treat something which could have been prevented in the first place. So, and not saying it's easy, because quite frankly, with, you know, our lifestyles, with fast food on every corner, it's more difficult yeah. to eat healthy. Uh, everyone has really busy jobs. It's hard to find the time to exercise, but you really have to do that to invest in yourself to stay healthy. So I think that's really critical. And I did want to just chime in too on the vaping. You know, that is the scariest thing to me. <laughs> because you have no idea what is in the vaping material. You have no clue. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's quite interesting. And I've talked to some young people and the very young, same young people that say, mm -hmm. I won't get a COVID shot because I don't know what's in it, but they'll go out and vape. <laughs> you yeah. truly yeah. don't know what's in that. So, I mean, that's, that's a huge issue as well. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to delve a little bit into pregnancy amongst black women. You know, black women have about three times the number of complications in childbirth as white women. And it's only been getting worse over the years. And there's a whole lot of reasons for that. And, you know, all of us are, e are either daughters or we're mothers or we're aunts, you know, we have family that, are in this, um, you know, in this target. I mean, actually, one of my colleagues, another physician, having a, a near miss with a pregnancy. Um, you know, and she, her mom's a doctor, and she was not really treated. You know, symptoms weren't caught on time, and she almost ended up. She was in a condition that we call it was preeclampsia. Um, but anyway, you know, that's one of the big issues about women of childbearing age that they don't often get the amount of care or the appropriate care to keep them healthy. 
What's your experience been with that? Or what pearls could you have to advise for, you know, women themselves, others who have daughters of childbearing age to try to make sure? Thoughts on that? Yeah, it was, it was kind of cutting in and out, but okay. um, yeah, how um, women of childbearing age can advocate for themselves in, yeah. uh, during pregnancy. Yeah. Um, what, yeah, what I recommend is, um, yeah, I, I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, I, I've seen it working in the hospital. Um, so what I recommend is, um, you know, even searching for um, an African-American ob -GYN, okay? Starting off with that. Um, uh, doing your part in um, re reducing, reducing those risks. So reducing those risks by exercising, starting off the pregnancy on, on a good weight, okay? So a lot of times, you know, the, you are, you know, overweight, obesity, and then in pregnancy, you increase your weight. And so making sure that um, you're taking your prenatal vitamins, you're, you're exercising, you're, you're not smoking or you know, any alcohol, those are ways to reduce the risk of like high blood pressure, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes and pregnancy. And so um, you know, make sure, you know, starting off on a good weight, exercising, if you have high pressure controlling that before, you know, making sure that's controlled, making sure your blood sugar is controlled, even before you consider pregnancy. And even taking your prenatal vitamins months before you even consider pregnancy because you're building up the folate stores, the folic acid in order to prevent neural tube defects, okay? So taking those prenatal vitamins are really important and reducing the stress. A lot of women, I'm seeing a lot of women are going through so much stress. I was gonna mention that too, mental health, a lot of stress reducing the stress because that stress that you're encountering, that is going to the baby too. So finding ways to reduce the stress can also make a difference. But, um, but don't be afraid to ask for another OBGYN if the, if the one that you're currently is, is not really taking you seriously. Ask for a new one, ask for a new doctor, ask for a new doctor, even when you're hospitalized and you're complaining of shortness of breath, like Serena Williams. And they didn't know that she, you know, she, you know, she has a history of pulmonary embolism and they didn't take her seriously, you know? So ask for another physician, ask for a second opinion, very important because it's a matter of life and death. It's a matter of life and death. And so. Yeah, it's interesting. Studies have shown that, you know, outcomes with black women are below that, you know, health outcomes with black women are below that of white women, even when you take into account socioeconomic status. So someone like Serena Williams, who has all the money in the world, still doesn't get taken seriously, you know, when she shows up in the hospital. So, I mean, there are certainly biases throughout the medical community that do not bode well for African-American women. So you do, you do really have to advocate for yourself. So, you know, there's one um, other question I think I want to run back to that was in the chat from one of the participants and she mentioned about over treating pain and that is definitely an issue too. As everyone knows, we have the opioid crisis right now. So there's, um, you know, there's, there's over treatment of pain, but to some degree there still is under treatment in some particular patients and certain individuals. So it really is tough and we have to, you know, as a physician sort of walk the line to make sure someone is, you know, pain is being treated appropriately, but of course, first do no harm. Certainly by over-prescribing pain medications, we can, we can do harm, um, you know, in, you know, as well. And also in the chat, someone mentioned that Allison Felix had serious pregnancy challenge a couple years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's across the board, you know, in general, women, you know, prenatal, childbirth, you know, we sort of have the worst outcomes of any industrialized country in America to start with, and then African American women are even worse than that. So mm -hmm. that is, that is a huge issue 
throughout, you know, black women in general in here and, you know, women in general and black women in particular here. So, you know, well, obviously the huge topic of the last year and a half and going forward is COVID. Mm -hmm. And as everyone I'm sure on here knows, COVID is affecting African Americans disproportionately to other individuals, but it is also affecting others. But then you throw, say for instance, you have a woman who's pregnant, you have to seek medical care during the pregnancy. And it's like, this is sort of a pandemic by itself of you know prenatal issues and poor child uh, outbursts. And, you know, and then you throw that inside another pandemic of COVID. You know, it's a very challenging situation, um, but what do you have to say um, Dr. Okule about, you know, pregnant women who need care, afraid to come in or afraid to go to the hospital because of COVID. And what about the vaccine in pregnant women? Yeah. Um, it, it's been, this COVID pandemic, it's been tough. It has been tough. Um, it's, it's been, it's been really, um, you know, you can't even explain, you know, some of the things that I've seen and, and, and what, you know, everyone has, has gone through because of this pandemic, um, pregnant patients. And I too, I, I had a baby during the pandemic. I had a baby during the pandemic. I had a baby last year, March 26, mm -hmm. smack during the pandemic, even during residency. And so um, it was, it was a very difficult, challenging time and um, I, you know, for, for my, for my first child, I had my, you know, mother was there for the, uh, for the birth, but even during this time, I could only have one person and that was my husband. Even that they were like, oh, should he be in there or should he not? So it was, um, it was, it was really, it was really difficult. The, um, the prenatal visits were very short. You know, you go in, you do your thing and you're out of there with a mask. And so, and I, I think my husband, he didn't even go to some of the visits because it was only, it was, it was only myself just to check me out and go. But, um, but I, I do recommend, um, you know, uh, that pregnant patients do see their OBGYN for those prenatal visits, just to check, check the baby, you know, have that Doppler on your stomach to, to check the heartbeat. Fetal heart tones are very important to make sure that everything is A-OK -okay with both you and the baby. Make sure, make, make sure that they do a urine. There's no protein in, in your urine contributing to preeclampsia. Make sure that your blood pressures are stable. All of this is done in the clinic. Unfortunately, you can't do this over a virtual. You can't do this. Family medicine could be virtual, but OBGYN at Kaiser, they've had to go back to the clinic because they've had to see their patients. You can't do, you, you can't do fetal heart tones over, over the phone. You know, you have to see the baby. You have to make sure that the baby is growing in size and, and appropriately for the gestational age. And so, um, so it's really important that uh, patients get their appropriate prenatal care and, 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 um, and don't be afraid, you know, because they are screening patients at the door with cough, cold symptoms, you know, it's only those who are going to the hospital with the cough, cold and symptoms, they will screen you right at the door going into the clinic. If you have any symptoms, you got to go home or you have to go to the hospital. And so they're doing a great job at screening them at the door so that COVID doesn't get into the clinics. And so it's, you know, so they're making it safe, trying to make it safe for pregnant patients to see their doctors because if anyone needs to see them, it's, you know, the pregnant patients have to see their, their OBGYN. And, um, and the vaccine in pregnancy, I've, I've seen some of my colleagues who, you know, they're, they're pregnant, they're also getting the vaccine. Some are waiting till after they deliver their baby to get the vaccine. So either one is fine, you know, as long as you're protected and you get the vaccine to build up your immunity you're building up your immunity, building up your T cells and B cells, your lymphocytes, in order to um, garner up the antibodies to protect, to protect yourself from COVID, okay? So, um, so yeah, don't be afraid, go to the clinic, Get, um, go to your prenatal visits, that is really important. Every four weeks, right? Every four weeks, and then once you start, you know, 36 weeks, 
34 weeks, you, they, they start seeing you, they start seeing you weekly. Okay, that's really important. I mean, it, it is important. And I've been, you know, doing some work from home, but I've been seeing patients throughout the pandemic as well. I mean, there are certain things that if you have it, male or female, like abdominal pain, we cannot always diagnose abdominal pain over the phone or mm -hmm. over a video visit. So a lot of times we do have to bring people into the clinic. And I would say right now, I mean, you'd still need to keep up on your mammograms. You need to keep up on your, you know, cervical cancer screenings. And you don't want to get too far behind because as we know, we have higher rates of cervical cancer. We have higher rates of breast cancer than other populations. And particularly in African-American women, we tend to have a more aggressive form of breast cancer at earlier ages. You know, black women, you know, 30s and 40s are pretty, it's pretty well known that we have what's called triple negative breast cancer at higher rates than a lot of other people. You know, this something hits women young, it, so if people say a whole different disease than a breast, you do need to keep up with, um, you know, your routine screenings as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to wrap um, back around with is just, um, you know, the vaccine. They, you know, I tell my patients, because, you know, people are hesitant to get the vaccine, you know, they have found that women who get pregnant after they've been vaccinated or during the pregnancy, they do find antibodies in the fetus. When the baby's born, they're born with antibodies. So, you know, there is some protection to the baby by getting the vaccine, you know, and, and it's, it's a scary thing for a lot of people because they're like, well, it hasn't been tested enough. It hasn't been tried and it's true. And I tell my patients, you know, no drug no vaccine, no medical therapy is ever tested first on a pregnant woman, period. It just isn't, you know, it just does not exist. You know, the best we can do on a medication is, well, we think it's safe or it appears that it's safe. We never can tell you what well, this drug has been part of a double blind clinical trial in pregnant women. It just does not exist. So you know, we do have to go by experience for pretty much all drugs in pregnant women and breastfeeding women. And, you know, but I do know when they did the vaccine trials, they had so many thousands of people. A lot of women volunteered for the trial. They got pregnant during the trial and there have not been any negative outcomes from that. So I just want to say, again, if you, you know, do what you need to do to protect yourself, but you don't need to be afraid of, of that. Um, so also, what sort of trends are you seeing with your patients now in, you know, particularly in black women, you know, younger black women and older black women that you see coming into clinic? You know, what sort of health trends, what's out there? What are people doing that might be the good, the bad, or the ugly? <laughs> Vaping is the ugly. You told us about that one. That's the yeah, ugly. That Yes. Ooh, so much vaping, marijuana, every patient, every patient, marijuana and vaping. <laughs> not, <my>. everyone. <laughs> no, not everyone, not every, but a lot of my young patients, I have to tell them it leads to so many things. It leads to so many things. You know, marijuana can even lead to mental health and schizophrenia and psychosis and um, low sperm count and also brain atrophy. And so these are some of the things that I, um, that I, that I tell my patients. But um, some of the trends that, I, that I've been seeing, again, um, obesity, a lot of my patients are even considering weight loss and fentermine taking weight loss pills in order to um, you know, reduce their weight. And that also has its um, side effects, palpitations, heart disease, heart issues, taking fentermine. Um, a lot of my patients, I am seeing a lot of ADHD, even in adulthood, for good childhood, a lot of adulthood, ADHD, uh, inability to focus, inability to concentrate on task at hand, 
Um, and then on methylphenidate, Concerta, Vyvanse, um, uh, um, Adderall, you know, these are a lot of the medications that the adults are taking um, because of ADHD. Um, I'm seeing a lot of mental health. I've seen it. I, I, I've seen it on, on it's uh, most of my patients, a lot of my patients are coming in mental health, depression, anxious, a lot of anxiety, even amongst the young. I had one patient that came in 14 years old, uh, suicidal, wanted to um, kill herself. Mm. And her mother also had mental health too. So it comes from generations, you know, mother is on antidepressants. Mother is on antidepressants, the child is on antidepressants. And so um, I even had one patient, he was so anxious and, and has so much anxiety, he was having panic attacks because he had been um, um, in the home um, quarantine, you know, cause they're doing uh, virtual um, schooling. So he has been at home for the past two years and doesn't know how to transition back to normal life. It doesn't know how to transition back to the world because he's been at home for two years. And so, and so these are some of the trends that I've been seeing even with young people um, amongst black women. I've been seeing a lot of uterine fibroids, so much uterine fibroids, iron deficiency anemia. That has been on the rise too. Um, obesity amongst our women. So I, I've been working, you know, obesity amongst our women, a lot of stress, but a lot of um, chronic pain, a lot of fibromyalgia. A lot of people are coming in chronic pain and then the opiate crisis, that's a whole nother conversation in itself. So much of that, requesting this, requesting that, wanting their refill, wanting that. Mm -hmm. And it's hard because as a Kaiser doc, you're just so overwhelmed. You're just like, okay, let me just go ahead and prescribe, but you have to follow the protocol, the cures report, urine drug screen to monitor all of that. You know, a lot of them are on even methadone, higher doses. And so, um, and that can even get overwhelming because then they're doctor shopping. You're getting patients that are where, you know, the doctor has retired. So now you're their physician and they're still expecting their Norco. They're still expecting their Percocet, you know, and they haven't had a urine drug screen for years. And a lot of times they're diverting that medication and they're, you know, so, um, so that's what I've been seeing. And um, that's what I've been seeing. A lot of medication on compliance. A lot of patients don't want to take their medications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's another interesting question in the chat that I yeah. think I'll, I'll kind of give you my take on it. And then we'll see, Dr. Okuli, what your take on it is. It's the question is, how do you feel about leaning away from pharmaceutical medications towards natural slash holistic remedies, aside mm -hmm. from major health issues like surgeries, et cetera? So I'll tell you my take on this. Um, first of all, no natural or holistic remedies have been through double blind controlled trials and approved by the FDA. So Why we're not? talking about, you know, COVID vaccines having temporary approval and, you know, now Pfizer has permanent approval and I'm sure Pfizer, you know, I mean, Moderna will be shortly thereafter. But if you take medications, every prescription medication had to obtain an FDA approval. Every natural and holistic drug on a shelf in your local drugstore or GNC has not been through FDA approval. They are not tested. They are not FDA approved because they are supplements. So that's not to say that they're all bad. Some of them are very good, but I mean, you really have to research a lot about this and you still have to make your own decision about it. But then too, you know, they simply are not put through the same rigorous review that prescription medications are. And there's, you know, a lot of reasons for this. I mean, a lot of it's political, a lot of it's financial. They really don't want to be prescriptions, you know, or drugs, they wanna be natural things, but let's be real, opium is natural. That's what all, you know, you know, you know, there's all kinds of very, very toxic things in the natural world that will kill you. So to some degree, I think when you are, you know, looking at these natural remedies over the counter, you really have to dig into the research. 
Then you got to look at where is it being produced? They found a lot of, you know, supplements which might be good, but they found they're being imported from, you know, foreign countries and they finally put them in a lab and they got arsenic in them and there's poison, you know, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. So I think it's a really slippery slope. You have to be very careful, very deliberate. I think most of us physicians can give opinions on some of them. I certainly cannot give an opinion on all of them because there's hundreds, if not thousands out there. Um, so I, yeah, so I don't know, what's your take on this? <laughs> Dr. Orakule, what's your take on this? Yeah, um, it, it's, it's interesting because a lot of my patients will come in, um, you know, with their, um, you know, vitamins or supplements that they're taking over the counter, medications that they found at, you know, um, this store and, Looks like you our, know, and, and they're not taking their, um, sorry. Looks like our Zoom might be freezing a little bit. Okay, sorry, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah. It's okay now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I recommend in the beginning is lifestyle changes. I don't go straight to medications in the beginning. I, I recommend lifestyle changes. Um, I recommend, you know, if you can get your diabetes down on your own, that's good. We don't have to start metformin. We don't have to start glipizide. Let's try going, let's try going to, let's try exercising. Let's try eating right, eating healthy. And then if we check your labs after that and still your levels are not good, then we'll go ahead and start metformin. Then we'll go ahead and start your lisinopril, your blood pressure medication. Statin is good to reduce stroke, stroke and heart attack, period. Your blood thinners are good to reduce stroke and heart attack if you have atrial fibrillation. So these are things that you have to take, like there's no question you have to take them, you know, because if you stop taking them, you can get a stroke and a heart attack. So, you know, all the supplements, you just really have to do your research. So each one, I have my patient bring in all their medications so I can go over each one with them. And, um, you know, St. John's Ward and this one and that one, Whew, so many different um, supplements now. So you really have to do your research. But like you said, all the double-blinded studies, all the studies that have been done on, on these medications, it's been proven that they work, right? It reduces blood pressure. It reduces your blood sugar. It controls your heart, it controls your heart rate. It, it reduces cholesterol, you know? So these are medications that have been proven, they've been tested, they've been tested and they've been proven to be correct and, 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 to, and, and to work. So take, not, not take your can be the difference between life and death if you don't take your uh, uh, statin or your um, Zorolto or your warfarin. Yeah, and I think that's true. And I think, you know, a lot of um, natural supplements will say, well, this has been tested. Well, the only one it's been studied by usually is the manufacturer who's making it, who obviously has a financial incentive to sell the product. Whereas, you know, most medications that come out on the market, they go through testing typically through universities. And they're just basically trying to figure out what works and what doesn't work. So there's not as much financial incentive for that, that type of review. I mean, and again, not to say that all of them are bad or don't work. I mean, there have been some studies, there's a question in here about knee pain in the 40s and 50s. And I can certainly relate to that. I'm in my 60s and I certainly have knee pain. But, you know, there have been some studies that show that you might get a moderate or modest effect from, you know, some anti-inflammatory take, you know, and again, they haven't gone through the rigorous control, but there's some natural medicine databases that your physicians can actually look into. And at least we can say, okay, 
this doesn't look like it'll hurt you. It won't do any harm. So it may or may not work, but it, you know, as long as it doesn't do any harm, I'm fine with you trying that. You certainly could try those different types of supplements. I mean, fish oil is one that tends to help some people. Of, co of course, glucosamine, chondroitin, I honestly I think we were really excited about it when it first came out, but now it's kind of like, yeah, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't but we pretty much know it's not going to um, hurt anything. So I think that um, that's fine. And, and Dr. You know, I was gonna say too, that a lot of, I'm seeing a lot of my elderly patients, polypharmacy, yeah. taking 15 to 20 medications is too much. It's too <laughs> much. Like, honestly, I, I, oh, I get on my patients, I get on them, I get on them. I said, what, what, what is this list? I want you to be taking maybe two or three, not like 10. And one of my patients wants to take, a, um, she wants to take clonopin with her oxycodone. I'm like, you okay. want to take a benzodiazepine with an opiate and she has COPD and respiratory distress. I'm right. like, okay, so you, so you want to kill yourself. And that, that, that's what you want to do, you know? So all these medications, polypharmacy, it's a big thing. Even amongst the elderly is too many medications. Maybe and two or three. And too many supplements. People will come in with a bag of 25 supplements. So much, so much. Well, I have to laugh about the supplements though, because, you know, literally going years and years and years ago back to medical school. And I never forgot what one of my professors said, like with vitamin supplementation, you know, particularly the water soluble vitamins, you know, you absorb what you need and you pee the rest out, you know, like vitamin C is a perfect example. And his comment was Americans have the most expensive pee in the world because we take all these vitamins and we just pee them right out. So and I've never forgotten that after all these years, he's like, you know, it's like, if you eat healthy, you know, get a little bit of vitamin D in the sun and, you know, eat lots of fruits and vegetables. You're going to get all the vitamins that, you know, minerals that you need, but we're really, we're really obsessed with taking all of these vitamins and supplements. He's like, yeah, we got the most expensive pea in the world. So I just thought that was pretty funny. Um, and Dr. Cook too, I wanted to have like, I wanted you to share a, like, like a personal story. My grandfather passed away from vascular. He had vascular dementia. He never took his blood pressure medication. He had many strokes and he had concoction of garlic jars that he created himself in order to reduce his blood pressure. He was doing, I mean, he had medical books. He thought he was the doctor. He would tell the mm -hmm. doctor what to do. And so, so it, you know, and so bless his heart, but it's just like, you have to take your blood pressure medication so your blood pressures are not so high so you don't have these many strokes and lead to vascular dementia. Yeah, that's true because people think about high blood pressure and what do you think about? You think about heart attack, but stroke is you know mm -hmm. huge. And then when you think about stroke, people think about some big gigantic stroke and people can't move their arm, they can't talk. No, you know what we're talking about vascular dementia or it's, you know, basically it's a lot of little tiny strokes in the brain that over time affect your memory, affect your cognition, you're able to reason and that type of thing. And we see that way more commonly than we do the big stroke that takes out a side of your body. And a lot of yeah. people don't know about that. I had an uncle that had the exact same thing because he had diabetes, he had high blood pressure, he had cholesterol. And he just kept having these tiny little strokes until he pretty much could not take care of himself. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's another big uh, issue that people need to consider. So um, going back to just one real quick thing about the chat about knee pain. I'm the expert on knee pain. I haven't had a knee replacement, but I have had meniscus surgery. I have had cortisone shots in the knee. Um, I think I torn my meniscus three times. So yeah, cortisone can help inflammation and you know healing in the knee. It's not your first go-to for knee pain. Usually it's physical therapy. Ice is your friend. And you know, doing the stretching and the icing, you know, if that doesn't work, a lot of times we will do a cortisone shot. I do them in clinic and they reduce inflammation and they certainly can help pain. But however, you can only do so many. Typically it's about no more than three a year. 
that you can actually do. And I can tell you if you have diabetes and your blood sugars are off the chart, we're not gonna do them because steroids can increase your blood sugar, even if it's injected into a knee. So um, yeah, so it is something that can actually help people along. Um, you know, knee replacement is kind of like the gold standard ultimate therapy. You know, all of us hope that our knees don't wear out to the point where we need a re knee replacement, but you know, what can you do? Weight, obesity, doc like Dr. O'Cooley was speaking of, if you, you know, a lot of times even losing 20 pounds, you know, it's, a, it's amazing how much weight and force is on a knee. Because if you think about it, you know, a knee may have maybe what, six inches of surface area or something like that. And all the weight from the thigh up is on that, those two knees. So that's a tremendous amount of weight and pressure. So even losing 10, 15, 20 pounds can take some weight off of those knees and can really help them a lot. So I work with a medical weight management program where people usually have a minimum of 40, 50 pounds to lose. We have a lot of people that lose over a hundred pounds and a lot of them get a lot of relief for their knees in that type of program. So that's something to consider. Um, and um, I'm just gonna jump down to the next question that's in the chat. They're talking about the rise and this is a really important issue. Have we seen a rise in mental health issues what no says, have you seen a rise in these mental health issues prior to COVID or has there been a steep rise? And I can say that, you know, during COVID, there's been a rise, you know, they're prevalent already, but, uh, you know, what are you seeing? I'm in the Bay, San Francisco Bay area, and I think you're out in Sacramento, so we're kind of close, but what are you seeing out there in your area? Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of mental health. People are losing jobs by, by I mean, losing jobs, losing homes, um, you know, so much mental health, a lot of homelessness in Sacramento, um, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stressors, a lot of stressors, even at work, work, work life, home life. And I told my patients that a little bit of anxiety is good, right? Um, if you didn't have anxiety, I would be a little concerned, right? Because that anxiety gets you to do things. But once the anxiety and depression, right? Because a lot of us, you know, it, we're, we're, you know, not every day is a good day. You have some bad days. But once it starts to impact, impact function, right? Function, um, um, you're you're not able to. Um, relate to others, um, you have, you know, decreased concentration, decreased focus, you're, you're not eating like you used to, you're not sleeping well, um, it's interfering with your day-to-day -day interactions with people, it's interfering with your day-to-day -day functioning, then that's where it can be a problem. And so, um, so yeah, I, I've seen a rise, I've seen a rise, I feel like I'm a psychiatrist every day, I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm a psychiatrist. And they are overwhelmed to the point where I don't even refer to mental behavioral health because I know they're just so overwhelmed and, and they're outsourcing the patients to um, other psychiatrists and therapists in the community. And so um, if I can treat the basics, you know, then that's what I do. But what I've been recommending is um, a lot of times, um, yeah, I go to antidepressants, but you know, I like therapy, a lot of pay, a lot of young people, they could benefit from therapy. I recommend it. Therapy, um, exercise, mindfulness exercises, um, you know, journaling, what I do, I even tell my patients, you know, um, you know, start like a gratitude journal or like I am statements, you know, waking up in the morning and, and telling yourself, you know, I am confident, I can do this, I can make it. A lot of times it's, um, you know, building up that, that self-esteem. And in some severe cases, I will, if they're screening, the questionnaire is high, I will start an antidepressant. Um, but a lot of times I really try to push therapy, seeing them frequently in the clinic. Um, but amongst my young patients, um, because this virtual, I think um, kids need to be in school. Kids need to be in school. That's, that, that's, that's, that's what I've seen. Wear a mask, but they need to be in school because they work better and they thrive better. I've had my patients come in and they're not even zooming into the the classroom. I mean, they're 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 playing games. They're they're doing their thing. They're not even listening to the teacher. They're not even. So I feel like a whole year for some of these kids is kind of like wasted, you know. So 
have them put on a mask and have them go back to school because um, yes, yeah, some of them thrive in the virtual environment, but some of them don't. Well, and so our kids pretty much in the Bay Area back in class. What about Sacramento? Oh, they are. Yeah, they are. Yeah, They're back now. Yeah, no, I think everybody agrees that that's best for them. But you got to keep them alive first. So right, yeah. I, you know, trying to keep right. people alive. Um, no. yeah, yeah, which is which is really um, important. So I just wanted to make one comment too. Therapy is great. It's often difficult to come by. Um, you know, you kind of have to do your research in terms of where you can obtain therapy. And again, there's a shortage of African-American psychiatrists as well as psychologists out there. So, I mean, it, it certainly can be a challenge, um, mm -hmm. you know, so that's just something to kind of think in, but, you know, but I was also going to comment that about 30% of what us primary care doctors do in clinic is mental health. It's either depression, it's anxiety. And, you know, studies have pretty much shown that. So we are very well versed in the basics of mental health. So by the time we're referring to psychiatry, typically it's a little bit more serious than that, or it's a major, major depression. We've gone through a couple different medications. We've gone through referring people out to therapists and it's not working. And then we may have to get the psychiatrist involved, but we do about 30% of our visit have some kind of mental health code on them. So that's just something else to keep and in mind. I've, I've even had patients. Um, I had one lady, Caucasian, in, in her 30s, came to me in tears during the appointment, in tears, going through so much stress. Single mom of two kids left the kids at home to attend the appointment, and the kids are eight and six. Mm. This is what I'm, I mean, and she's just in tears. I mean, like, what do you do? You know, the pandemic, then she lost her job. She was evicted from her home. She had to move in with her mom. So people are going through, yeah. people are going through. I had another young lady, um, Hispanic lady, single mom with three boys, father is in jail. She's taking care of all three boys on her own, mm -hmm. working every day. A lot a lot of times it's not, you know, and they're talking about chronic pain and this and that. When you get to the root of it, it's a lot of stress that they're it's going through. It's a lot of stress. And you I know, think if my anyone is not really having stress, stress during the pandemic, something's going on with you. Because I think everybody has had some level of stress. And I don't know how you guys are doing down there in Southern California now, but I can tell you this summer is not as bad. It's getting really bad now. But last summer, it's like, okay, we have the COVID, we have the lockdown, we have all this stuff. We're going through the stress. But the thing that threw me over the edge was the fires and the smoke. So you couldn't go outside and walk because my way to, well, two ways I kind of reduce stress. I, well, a few ways, but I like to get outside. So I like to walk. We have nice trails up here, get out, do that. Um, I ride horses. That's another way I reduce stress. And I like to swim. Well, during the pandemic, the pools are closed. When the fires came, you can't go outside. You can't take a hike because you can't breathe, can't take the horse out. And that's when I was just like, okay, this is too much. <laughs> you know. And I know the fires are affecting Sacramento worse than the Bay Area. But yeah, we're all smoked out up here in Northern California right now. <laughs> And then it's worse for people who got, you know, have seasonal allergies, allergic rhinitis and, and asthma and COPD. They need their inhalers and fires on top absolutely. of that. It's too much. It's too much. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. So there's a very interesting question in here in the chat, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit. Um, it's from, from Betty. And it says, what is your facility stance on GFR separation by race? So I'm going to touch on this a little bit because I've been involved with it a little bit. So for those of you who don't know, GFR is glomerular filtration rate, and it has to do with kidney function. And for years now, they've done studies and found that, you know, these studies supposedly found that um, glomerular filtration rates were different for African Americans. Americans versus white people, which is always who they compare us to. It's white people, it's African Americans. So what they found is that they would tolerate a slightly higher GFR 
for African or, or more poorly functioning GFR for African Americans than they would for white people. So what might be normal or abnormal for a white person would they would consider normal for a black person. Mm. Well, one of the consequences or outcome of this type of thing is if people are starting to have kidney problems and they need to be referred to a nephrologist and they need to be referred on to say for a kidney transplant, you had patients who were black that if there were, they were white, they would have been referred for kidney transplant, but because they're black, they were not. And so, you know, actually this is sort of a raging debate in medicine right now. Um, Kaiser, I know our division of research is involved with this. They are looking at it very closely. Um, I have a personal friend who was a nephrologist at UC San Francisco who was heavily involved in this. And, you know, but there, you know, this is sort of, it's, it's a raging debate. I don't think we have the outcome right now, but there's a big movement right now not to use race-based, um, you know, measures in this way. So mm -hmm. I think that's a huge issue and um, looks like our other speaker has joined us now. <laughs> All <Whoa. right. laughs> so Dr. Choctaw, how are yeah. you? I am very well, thank you. I apologize for the, for the delay. I had difficulty getting the link, but, but everything is good. All is well. Oh, great. Well, we're kind of like in the middle of a conversations. We're kind of all over the place. So okay. maybe you can just give us a brief introduction. I know that you do a lot of administrative work. Are you still doing clinical work as well? I am not doing direct clinical work. I just real quickly about my background. Um, I'm, I'm a general surgeon. I've been in practice in general surgery for over 40 years. Uh, from there, I went to uh, becoming a member of the executive team at m and uh, health, uh, which used to be called Citrus Valley Medical Center. Um, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee. I was born and raised there. I went to medical school at Yale Medical School, um, and I did my residency there, an internship there, uh, and did a fellowship at USC in trauma. Mm -hmm. um, for the last three years, I have been working for the Joint Commission. The Joint Commission is a regulatory agency that regulates hospitals all over the country. Um, and it's one of the best associations I have had because I get to travel the entire country. Uh, and that's particularly interesting during the whole pandemic situation that we're now experiencing. Wow, that is, that is fascinating to get to go in. And you know, for people who don't know what the Joint Commission does is let's just put it this way, your hospital and clinic has to pass a joint commission report or it will be shut down. So, <laughs> so everybody is always worried when the joint commission is coming to visit. That's for sure. That's true. They, they are very nice to us when we arrive. I, I must oh, yeah. admit they're very nice to us. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they are. So let me just get your take on, you know, that's interesting because you're traveling the country and going into the hospitals. How do you think hospitals are doing managing, keeping standards up, keeping services up during the middle of this pandemic? I think quite honestly, they're struggling. Um, and I think what I've learned is that the ones that were organized and had good processes in place are obviously able to adapt much more easily than the ones who did not have good processes in place. Um, it's sort of like a relationship. Uh, you know, that if your relationship is stable and strong, uh, when things happen, you're able to get through it pretty easily uh, and maybe even get even stronger. But if, if there were problems ahead of time, many times that tends to make it worse. It I, 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 am, I am impressed with hospitals, though, because I think they are innovating and they're learning some things that they did not know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, learning some things that they did not know. So maybe just one tip, because we talked a little bit earlier about how African American women can advocate for themselves. What should women and men, African American men, what should they look for? You know, you know, readily available information at least that they can get in a hospital before. You know, if you're in a say Riverside and you've got you know, three different hospitals in the area and you know you need to go into a hospital, what can the consumer look at before they choose which hospital to go into? Well, you know, I, I always like sort of the people approach, 
You know, like if you know somebody, a nurse or a doctor or just an employee to ask that individual about that individual hospitals, there are rating um, um, uh, situations out there. I'm, I'm never sure how well to trust the ratings because a lot of the very, very smart hospitals will, will do things to boost their image. Mm -hmm. online because they know people are looking and trying to decide. I personally like the personal uh, touch. The other thing is um, I encourage patients and, and individuals to always ask questions. If something doesn't look or smell quite right to you, then definitely ask questions. And if you ever have a physician and or organization and you are asking questions and they're uncomfortable with you asking questions, then go somewhere else. Go somewhere else. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. So going back, we were having this conversation about, you know, GFR glomerular filtration rate and someone um, put in the chat and said, do you believe that these tests are not always best for black people? And, you know, and so that's really one of the most interesting questions because if you like, you know, black people, we are not all genetically the same, you know? It, exactly. I mean... <laughs> and color is not a race. Right. <laughs> color is not a race. Um, and I, so to answer your question specifically, GFR has nothing to do with your race. It's just an independent test that you get for humans right. to evaluate their uh, status of, of, of their renal function. Um, and I think, I think a lot of times we can sort of overthink it you know, if we put everything in a black-white spectrum, then, and I particularly see this certainly with uh, uh, the pandemic and people being unvaccinated, I, I think that's a mistake. And I think it works against us, quite honestly. Yeah, and I, I personally think it's, it's, shifting, it's shifting back the other way. Um, yeah, you know, because if you do my genetics, you know, you do Dr. Choctaw's genetics and everybody else here on this Zoom call, they're not going to all be, they're going to be some similarities, but they're not going to all be the same. So no, no. yeah, it's just, it's kind of a real slippery slope. And, and the reality is, and I, I, I majored in biochemistry as an undergraduate at Tennessee State. You know, if, if you look at all of our DNA or everybody's DNA, it is 99.9% .9 exactly the same, 99.9%. .9 so when we talk about differences, we're talking about that 0.1%. Um, and I think, I think a lot of times I, it's, it's been used to sort of frighten um, you know, African-Americans more than it should be. Um, and I think particularly where it comes to health. Now, there's no question that healthcare disparities exist and folks have not been treated equally and properly. And, we, and that is still a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just kind of going through the chat again. And yeah, I mean, it, you kind of already answered that. They said, you know, the difference between Caribbean Blacks and Black Americans and, you know, um, Genetically, like you said, 99% across the board, everybody's the same. So there's those really small differences. But as we know, in different medications, you know, like for instance, I may give a patient, you know, an ACE inhibitor for blood pressure. It might not work on them. I might have to go to a calcium channel blocker. And that happens sort of all over the map too. So, you know, there are some differences in each of us that, you know, our bodies don't necessarily respond exactly the same, so. I, I, I think that's certainly true, but, but I, 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 I think we, we need to be careful assuming that Black folks react to medicines differently from other folks and that sort of thing. We're certainly not all the same, uh, and we are different, but I think those differences have to be unique and special to that individual patient with that individual doctor. I get real uncomfortable with this oversimplification. I am black, therefore I am blah, 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 blah. Just because I'm black, you don't know me. You know, I'm, I'm you know, we, we're not all monolithic is what I'm trying to say. God made us individually and that's a good thing. That, that, that's absolutely a good thing. Um, so whether for good or for bad, I, I get uncomfortable with, with the oversimplification a lot of times, mm -hmm. especially okay. in healthcare. Okay. So here's another interesting question. Um, 
that's kind of come in that um, someone asked, it says, do you have an opinion on the stigma? And I don't know if it's a stigma per se, but that's what they put a stigma between a DO and an MD. <laughs> yes, I do. I think they're the same. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I do not think that it makes a bit of difference. I am an MD. Like I said, I'm an MD from Yale. I know a lot of DOs. I would let them take care of me and my family. I've got six grand grandchildren who I love dearly. I would let them take care of my grandchildren. I don't think there's a single bit of difference. As I understand it, um, uh, the DOs used to do manipulation. Some of them do, some don't. But, but you take that part away, a doctor is a doctor is a doctor. Yes. And I... I agree. I agree. Um, there, there's no difference. A lot, you know, in medical school, my deal friends used to crack everybody's back, you know, with their right. manipulations right. and stuff. So <laughs> they just have that added skill, you know. They're an MD with an added skill. Exactly. So yeah. So there's no difference. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and I actually considered going to DL school because you know they have the one in Pomona. Yes, yes. they do. <laughs> as, as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit of trivia. When they first opened that school in Pomona, I got a call from my alumni association at Tennessee State because apparently they like to have representatives from all over the country there. And they asked me to represent Tennessee State at the inauguration of the first president at that, at that school. Oh, wow. uh, and subsequent to that, I used to go out and give lectures to the first year class on burn management because my fellowship in trauma was with burn trauma. Uh, which I did at least for three or four years. So I, I have some familiarity with their training and the students and that sort of thing. And that just reinforces my belief that it's all the same. Yeah. I think, yeah and I think what's, you know, really more important is like DO and MD, it's, you know, minimum of four years of training. Yep. But then after that, you go into your internship and your residency. And yep. that's where you really learn how to take care of patients. So that's true. It has more to do with that training than necessarily the DO versus the MD. I agree. But, you know, Wait, yeah. Dr. Cook? Yes. Now, I have a question for, for you guys, too. Now, what are your thoughts on, like, nurse practitioners, right? And so the rise in NPs and, and uh, what do they say? They have a, uh, the, 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 the heart of a nurse, but the, something as, you know, as a doctor. But, you know, I feel like there's been a rise in NPs and them kind of, you know, taking over. <laughs> I can, I, can I answer that real quickly? Um, I, as I said, what I do now is I travel all over the country, and I used to believe uh, that California was the center of the healthcare universe, because most of my training and practice has been in California. What I have learned, that that's not true, that across the country depends on where you are. And there's one trend that I've definitely seen, that uh, allied health professionals are taking on more and more and more clinical responsibility uh, for multiple reasons from physicians. Mm -hmm. And my point is, it's a reality. I think in general, I think it's probably beneficial to the patient as long as it's a good system. But, but I think that's a reality that's just occurring. A lot of it has to do with shortage of physicians in certain areas, uh, but they're clearly uh, taking on more of a role. So even with the John Commission, we're, we're evaluating them more closely uh, because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. You're right. And particularly, you know, being a primary care physician, I'm an internist and Dr. Orakule is a family medicine. We're both considered primary care and there are, there is a shortage. I mean, that's the bottom line and, you know, we need help. <laughs> You know, sometimes it gets a little dicey. I don't know, um, you know, one of the things that came up in our clinic, if it got too complex, it went from a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant to a doctor. Right, right. And that's pretty much how it works. If it's simple, if it's a young, healthy 18 year old with minimal issues or 20 some year old don't have a lot of problems, not an issue. It's just when it gets more complicated medically and, you know, I look at it very simply, you know, if you look at the amount of training we have, it's different. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. And I was going to add a plug too. Um, if there's anyone, any grandsons, any sons or any daughters 
that want to go into medicine, give me, I'll put my contact information in there. Um, I do a lot of mentorship. Um, we need more doctors. We need yes. more African-American doctors. Yes. And so we need to put that, put that out there. Kaiser has a medical school, Tyson Medical School in Pasadena, free medical school free medical school for the first four, you know, four, four years of medical school. UC Davis, I'm connected. I, I do a lot of mentorship with the UC Davis medical students. Um, one of my mentees, he's a student. They have six students. It's called the ACE program, a three-year accelerated medical school, UC Davis called the ACE program. And so, and then post -backs. I was a part of the UCLA post -back and I've had students post -back program. So Hit me up, let me know. I, I have a lot of resources, scribing post -back programs. There's plenty of resources out there, but we need to increase the amount of us in the medical field. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And also in one of my roles is President Sinclair Miller Medical Association, which is the local chapter of the NMA, which is basically African-American physicians across the country. Our primary reason for existing in addition to supporting each other is to fundraise for scholarships, which we have a scholarship gala every um, you know, every fall, and we give scholarships to high school graduates who are considering going on to medicine, and we give scholarships to medical students. We have some private funders that give scholarships to residents. Um, so, you know, we're definitely involved in that. And, you know, the number of African American physicians in our medical students today is less than it was in the 1970s. There are fewer than, you know, there are more, you know, they're actually about the same number of black medical students. There's more women, there's fewer men. So, you know, but we need more of both. So that is definitely something if people are interested um, for sure, probably could reach out to any of us about that. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna move down just so real quickly in the chat because believe it or not, we're running out of time, which is amazing. Um, okay, so someone just had a comment said, um, we like to make those differences like PhDs, educational doctors and MDs all called doctor with different degrees. But yeah, we do different things. I think that's what it comes down to. Um, in my family, it's kind of interesting. There's two Dr. Cooks. My other sister's a PhD and she's on faculty at Loyola Marymount. So, but totally different types of jobs. Um, uh, Okay. Oh, there's one other question. Um, now, this is interesting. Someone asked, can you speak to DNA-based medications? Can you define DNA-based medication? Is Kimberly there? Can she unmute herself and maybe kind of elaborate a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I'm just, you know, the studies that, you know, you hear about, you know, uh, medications that target uh, certain, certain, um, you know, uh, that they, they studied, you know, certain characteristics in uh, the DNA and they, they use uh, that, that information to develop uh, you know, medications that are specifically for you. It's kind of like the, uh, I think, uh, I think it's something similar to the uh, bioidenticals for, uh, for a hormone treatment. You know, I think that's something that it's along those lines. I've kind of read about it. So something that it's, 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 it, you know, they look at what, you know, you're made up of and, and, you know, target the medications that, work best with you, your DNA. So um, and I, and I'll, I'll even offer that, you know, you mentioned a couple of medications that, you know, it, that when you, when you look at those medications, they seem to be more effective uh, with certain populations. Now, I don't know if that's just because they were used with more that, you know, the testing was done for those populations and then they, you know, they prescribed them to everyone else and, and didn't get the same types of results. So, you know, it kind of speaks to, you know, the possibility that there are, you know, that, that, that tiny bit of difference between the human D DNA between, you know, individuals uh, collectively, um, you know, that it may show up in, in, in the medications that are developed. Yeah, because I'm not familiar with any DNA specific medications, frankly. 
Okay. There, 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 there are some medications that may very well be associated with genetic disorders, you know, like, like sickle cell and sickle cell, um, uh, sickle cell disease. As a matter of fact, I, I think it was some months ago, I saw in 60 Minutes, quite honestly, uh, where they had developed uh, a genetic based type of medication so that patients with sickle cell disease did not have the pain or to treat the pain that they have. So th th there's always been- well, is, that a, is, that a, is that a difference though, when you talk about genetic versus DNA? Cause I, you know, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. So I'm just kind of using the term that I'm most familiar with. You know, you can, you but, can well, get the, your- The genes yeah. are in the, are, DNA. Are in the, the, the cell, right. um, uh, inside the nucleus of the cell. Right. Uh, and that, that's where a lot of the things that determine what the cell does or doesn't do. Right, exactly. Um, but and and sickle cell is a genetically based uh, disease. In other words, you you pass it on, or you can pass it on through your DNA, right. you know, parent to child or grandparent right. to child, and that so, sort of thing. So, is the medication targeting? So then, the medication is targeting the DNA. The the, the medication is targeting the DNA. Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, okay. there, there are what they, you know, that's interesting because there are these rare genetic diseases that there's a lot of companies that are trying to research and find drugs for. And a lot yeah. of them are kind of almost like orphan drugs because there's so few people that have this problem and it costs billions of dollars to come up with them. So, I mean, there's like a few, I have a rheumatoid arthritis patient who's on a million dollar a, a year drug. Right, right. So there's a mm -hmm. few of those out there, but that is certainly not. That's not the norm. No, definitely okay. not the norm. But you know, but then again, I'll, I'll tell you a question I get all the time. I've been getting more requests in the last year to get their blood type done. Why? Because they read somewhere that type O, type whatever, type whatever doesn't have COVID or you can take this, that or the other if you have this kind of blood type. I get that question, I swear, like every week or two. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a my my granddaughter and my mom both did and I haven't done it yet. They did. I don't know if they did the I think they did the 23 and me DNA test. But, um, I, you know, I've and I've heard that, you know, those organizations will actually target you. There's there, you know, they're actually doing some kind of and I've seen the advertisement. I don't know if it's them specifically where they're doing the advertising of dieting. Right. So, you know, uh, you know, based on your DNA, they they can offer the best diet for you. Uh, you know, so that so that's kind of where my question is, is there anything in that, you know, if, you know, that's going on in the medical community that even supports uh, that, you know, because, we, you know, you spoke a lot about just eating healthy and and, um, you know, you know, exercise, but, you know, you, you do hear and see things about, you know, for some exercise is not, you know, easy to do, right? And so if there is a way to target, um, you know, to, to, to offer to you the best, uh, you know, diet for, you know, again, your DNA for your cell type, so to speak, um, you know, is there, you know, something to that? I am it's not aware of that. I am not okay. aware of that. And, and if I, you know, and that almost sounds like a scam to me, you know, <laughs> it, it, as long as I can remember, yeah. people have always been talking about a magic pill to right. make you lose weight. That was right. safe. <laughs> that you wouldn't have to exercise. You could eat anything you wanted. And I have yet to see that really come to fruition. So I, my, my question to, my answer to that question would be, would be no. Okay. Now the 23 and me, and if I remember correctly, that's like the ancestry, yes, is that like the ancestry.com yes. and that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Yes, yeah, it I, is. I, I, I am a little leery about that, particularly as it relates to minorities. Now, uh, keep in mind, these are, this is just my personal opinion. Right. These are proprietary companies that basically um, take samples from you and then tell you about your lineage and that sort of thing. Right. And, they, and, they, and they probably are accurate for the most part, but there's no way to validate what they're doing, number one. Number two, a lot of what they're doing is based on what they have in a database. So right, absolutely. Database. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I've always been suspect that I'm not convinced that a lot of information is in that database on, 
on minorities, so African right, that, right, that doesn't and already have result, to have some bias, right? Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not like you. <laughs> accurate. That yeah. information is that comes out about African Americans. Right. It exactly. may be very accurate about Europeans. Right. But I'm not sure it's all that accurate about African Americans. Right. I, 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 I'm, rip, I'm absolutely in agreement on that. I have the same kind of, you know, you know, the data, you know, what the, the data is the data, right? And it, but, but often the data is skewed in terms of collection and what you're looking for. And, yes. and there are inherent biases in, in yes. that. So yeah, I absolutely agree with that. you can't validate that. it. Yeah. You, you, yeah. Can't, you can't double check it. You can't make sure. And that's part of science. That's part of healthcare. Right. That if I come up with a study and I say I can cure X, someone else has to validate that before right. it becomes peer reviewed and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and I just think one, you know, we just need to be careful yeah. uh, about that. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I work I agree. Thank you. <laughs> and I definitely discourage people about the, the blood type diet. The, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the astrology diet, the yeah, no, birthday no. diet. I mean, they're all out there because people are selling books and products, but yes. I don't think there's really any science behind those. But you're right. We're always looking for the easy way because weight is not easy. Exactly. <laughs> it's just not. Well, maybe it's almost 730. So maybe any closing thoughts before I turn it back over to Corey? Dr. Owakuli, any closing thoughts? No, I just want to thank um, the Cal Poly Pomona um, Black Student Alumni Association. I want to thank you, Dr. Cook. I want to thank you, Dr. Um, uh, Choctaw, for you know all of your work in the community. I mean, I mean, you know, looking up to you all. You all are my role models, you know. And so, what you have done in the community um, is amazing. And so um, I just want to thank you for this opportunity, for this platform, and, and for including me in this discussion. Really appreciate it. As I was saying, you're our future. So that's what we, <laughs> we're, we're depending on you. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, Dr. Shakta. Uh, well, I, I too would, would, would like to thank uh, uh, my, my good friend, Walt Allen, and, and, and thank all of you for giving me this opportunity. I think the more we talk, the better things become. Uh, because we share information. I always learn something that I did not know. And I, I, I think this is a good thing. And I thank you and your leaders for taking the courage and the, uh, the expertise to put something like this on. I think this is a positive and we should do more of it. So thank you. Yeah, and I'd like to thank you for having me on as a Cal Poly alumni. I was more than happy and excited to do it and help whenever I can and hope to get more involved. So, and thank you to our amazing panelists and I will return it back over to you, Corey. Thank you, Dr. Cook. Um, really appreciate the panel. Uh, it was a very lively conversation. We gained a lot of information and for the people that didn't attend, please feel free to share this. Well, the for the people that did attend, please feel free to share this. It is recorded, so we'll be uh, it's going to be accessible on YouTube for you to share with your friends and families, because like Dr. Choctaw said, it is very important that we get the word out there and we continue these conversations. Um, again, I want to thank the board. I want to thank the alumni office. And lastly, I would want to encourage anyone that is a Cal Poly alum to join the alumni association as a member. We'll be putting the membership link in the chat box and then also uh, we are starting a scholarship fund for our black students at Cal Poly. So uh, please feel free to visit that if you have um, the means. And I know it's a very hard time during these times, during this pandemic time. Uh, we definitely would appreciate contributions to establish that scholarship. Um, everybody have a safe night. Um, if you did want, I know some people wanted to contact and communicate, please drop your LinkedIn link in the box or your email or anything. And uh, let's continue to network and build. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.